Uh, last week, we, we breezed through about uh, 10,000 years of communication history in a, less than two hours, quite a few. Hopefully, you didn't lose too many people along the way. Uh, one thing, though, when we talk about in terms of the technological advances of society and the emergence of mass media, uh, how it opened up a whole new uh, world of ideas and information to the average person. What we haven't explored up to this point is how the mass media also provided the means for a revolution and how people were entertained. And obviously, anybody who uses media today knows that a good chunk of the time you spend with media is being entertained. So it's an important uh, a question to explore and to look at some of the uh, roots of that as well. Um, now, in the early years of civilization, uh, what passed for entertainment was probably pretty basic. Think about maybe um, a prehistoric uh, tribes uh, sitting around a, a fire, maybe telling stories, uh, telling jokes, uh, maybe as, as, as they progress in their own civilizations, uh, coming up with songs or performances. But very simple and, and very intimate uh, in those settings. Yet even once um, art, uh, music, things like that start to become a bigger part of our culture, of our society, these are not things that are enjoyed by the masses. So for instance, has anybody ever studied uh, the history of some of the great uh, Renaissance artists or some of the great uh, classical composers of their, their eras? And if you have, what, what do you know about how they made a living? Anybody have any idea? How did the Renaissance artists make a living? Or how did uh, the composers like uh, Mozart uh, make a living? Yeah, he was hired uh, by royal courts, commissioned to write uh, music pieces, to write uh, operas, and uh, to uh, get paid by royalty. And who, who was the audience for, for those performances, by and large? Who did they tend to be? Yeah. Yeah, people in, people in the upper echelon uh, of society. What, what about uh, uh, an artist like a Michelangelo? What, what about his uh, uh, work and how he was paid and compensated for the work he performed? Anybody know about that? They just put, did he said, I'm, I'm going to do a statue of David, I'm putting it out the way who wants to do, who wants to pay for this, or how, what typically would happen? Yeah. Church again. Church, uh, you know, think about the Sistine Chapel, for instance, or the Piazza in, in uh, uh, the Vatican. Uh, these are examples of, of works of art that he was commissioned to do for the church. Uh, likewise, uh, the wealthy families of, of that era of Italy would also uh, pay to have works of art done, often for their own benefit, often uh, sometimes featuring members of their own family uh, being immortalized in a statue or a portrait, but uh, it was always for a very select audience and for people who could pay for it. Uh, now that's, that's great on a lot of levels because we have so many great works of art because of these wealthy families, because of the church, but again, if you think about how much enjoyment was initially had by these works, uh, very little by the masses. Um, but then something starts to happen, and it, it starts with a kind of a shift in society. Uh, by around the 1600s, a middle class is starting to emerge. Remember we talked about the importance of the middle class in terms of the information age. The fact that people had a little more discretionary income to spend on things such as newspapers. Well, the same thing is happening in various uh, Western civilizations in the 16 and 1700s. Uh, for instance, uh, places like uh, uh, London, uh, where tablets are very popular. Um, you can't really see that too long. Flip this light down. Um, yeah, that a little bit better. People go to taverns. Uh, uh, obviously, the job one of going to a tavern is to drink, right? But uh, since you're all there, what else might be able to happen? Uh, well, what happened in a lot of cases, 
was that uh, these patterns, in order to draw more people into their business, would would then uh, hire people to perform. Uh, you know, somebody is playing a guitar or some other string instrument, uh, singing songs, singing ballads, uh, while the patrons uh, uh, enjoyed beverages. So it, it became kind of a business model. People actually had time to go to taverns now. Again, this is the concept of leisure time, which wasn't wasn't really a concept in, in previous generations, but now suddenly was. Likewise, this is a poster for a vaudevillian show in both America and in Europe. Vaudeville, uh, the song and dance, burlesque, those kind of things were starting uh, to, to take off. So there was definitely more entertainment options in terms of uh, what people could have in terms of the masses. But again, it wasn't mass entertainment. You had to actually travel to your local pub or go to a, a vaudeville show to, to be entertained. It, you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that was uh, mass distributed. And it's also important to point out at this, at this juncture, too, in terms of the entirety of the entertainment artistic world, who's making the money? Let's, let's, uh, one of the, we talked about Mozart, for instance, uh, uh, composing operas for royal houses and, and performed by these, these opera singers. Uh, they tended to be, as entertain, entertainers at the upper echelon, uh, of the pyramid, so to speak, in terms of uh, their lifestyle, how much they are compensated, okay? Because why? They're working for royalty. Obviously, they're, they've got a very nice job and they've got a very nice payday. If you're working in a tavern, if you're working in a, a vaudeville act, how much money do you think you're going to make? Very little. You are definitely, in terms of the entertainment food chain, you were at the bottom. The people who perform for royalty for the uh, higher reaches of society, they're the ones making the money. The artists, the opera singers, those kind of people, all right? So, something else is going on too. We talked about the printing press. The printing press is, is, the, is the first thing uh, that really starts to change uh, things in terms of artists, their compensation levels, who, who fits where on the scale of, of success. Uh, for instance, prior to the printing press, books were still written, but can you, can you name an example prior to the printing press where any writer made a successful amount of, uh, of money, made, made an important amount of money by writing books? Can anybody think of an example of that prior to the printing press? Why not? Why, why did some of the great writers prior to the uh, 1400s not make a good living off of writing books? <coughs> yeah. Not many people had access to books. Right. To, 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 to make money from books, you have to be able to sell those books. And if they are hand-written and hand-copied, it's, it's not going to be a very successful business venture. Now you get to the 1800s, and you have people like uh, Charles Dickens, uh, Mark Twain, who do something that no writer in history had ever done before this time, which is become wealthy in their own lifetime. Become wealthy from providing entertainment. This is unheard of for writers. Uh, and, and this is what's happening. Both Charles Dickens and Mark Twain uh, made fortunes uh, off their books. Books also start having a social impact, too. The other example I have here is uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, which came out uh, uh, just, just prior to uh, the Civil War. And for the abolitionist movement that was going on in this country, this book uh, was very impactful, and a lot of people were talking about it, and it was... It was generating discussions about the, the slavery question in the United States. So books are having a financial impact, and now they're having a social impact as well because of mass media. But then uh, something happens, okay, in terms of um, flipping, flipping the equation even more in terms of who's successful and, and who isn't. Um, the invention of motion pictures. All right, this and it's 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 pretty interesting. Uh, as as movies first come into a play, 
uh, just how quickly they take off. And, and the people who are, who are making these movies, in many cases, were people who were struggling artists just a few years earlier. A great example uh, would be uh, Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin uh, uh, worked in London as a vaudeville performer, made next to nothing doing it, decided to uh, move to the United States just as the film industry started. He travels out to California and decides to get in on the ground floor of this. Uh, now Charlie Chaplin, uh, as, as he does this, he um, would ultimately end up at the peak of his career uh, in, the, in the 1920s, would be making a million dollars a year. Okay, A former vaudeville performer in the 1920s making a million dollars a year. Think about that for a second. Would you be happy making a million dollars a year in 2016? I, I would be delighted to be making a million dollars a year. Not likely you know, on a professor's salary, but that would make you very happy to do that. Um, Think about now 1920 terms. That's almost 100 years ago. How much money that was a year. And he's making it just by uh, uh, making movies uh, and, and uh, creating these whole new audiences. So think about, for instance, what this means in terms of, uh, remember, remember we did the uh, simplified model of the social world. You have the social world in the middle and the different media aspects around it, the media audience, product, technology. This technology of movies, think about how it disrupted, helped to disrupt, just like the, the printing press did, helped to disrupt what was happening in terms of society. Think about it in terms of the pecking order of who's making money and who's not making money. All right. People who used to be tavern performers, people who used to be vaudeville performers, now through motion pictures are having the opportunity to become very wealthy. People who were the high end of the echelon, talking about again the opera singers, the classical composers, the people who had the best paying jobs in entertainment, now they're closer to the bottom. They're moving down the list because they're getting passed up by these other people. And what's the key, what's the key ingredient that is making these movie performers, and then later as, as sound recordings come about, it's making uh, popular musicians more successful than, say, the classical or operatic musicians. What, what's the key ingredient here? Yeah. A larger audience. A larger audience, a mass audience. The thing that didn't exist before, and be, without its existence, you have a certain pecking order to what kind of entertainment is successful, what kind of entertainment only makes you peanuts. Now, the entertainment that used to just make you peanuts can be distributed on a larger scale. And the ability to distribute that on, on a larger scale is suddenly going to make uh, some people, like Charlie Chaplin, very, very rich. Um, and you can see it marked in society, too. There was, I think in, in one of the articles I signed for last week, uh, there was a reference to a, a study that a sociologist did of, of US periodicals, US magazines over a, a period of time. Uh, he looked at uh, two magazines in particular, uh, Collier's and the Saturday Evening Post, two magazines that were uh, very important and very well read in the uh, early 1900s. And he looked at these periodicals over a 40-year period. And it was interesting what he found out. And think about this, this change in terms of what you see when you pick up magazines today. Uh, at the beginning of this 40-year period, uh, the, the stories and profiles inside these magazines dealt mostly with business leaders and politicians. Their coverage of the arts and entertainment, for instance, uh, usually was very brief. And it focused mostly on people like opera singers, sculptors, and concert pianists, okay, though, but they weren't very many of those anyway, but when they had arts features, that's what they had in. 
40 years later, these same magazines, it was the artists and entertainers uh, that were written the most about. And more specifically, it was the heroes of popular culture rather than high culture. We're talking about the movie stars, the popular singers of the time, and uh, even the baseball players, okay? How did baseball players get into this? What was the technology? Okay, because baseball's been around a long time. But suddenly, as you get into the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, baseball players suddenly become very well paid, uh, obscene amounts of money for that era, and including lots of endorsements. What happened? Yeah. I feel like with radio, you can hear about players like Babe Ruth and how well they were playing. Right. Again, here's a sport that's been around a long time. Here's a sport that's popular in America, but prior to radio, if you want to know what's going on with the game, you have to be in a position to go to a ballpark, which means typically you have to live near an urban area where there is a baseball team and be able to go and watch them. But for average people uh, in, in, in the rural areas and just in general, uh, baseball is not <laughs> something they can tune into every day. Now all of a sudden, uh, uh, with radio, it changes that entire dynamic. What you have going on now is a situation where you can learn the players' names. You can learn, you know, all about, you know, what kind of heroes, uh, you know, they they are for their team, and uh, really get into it. I, I did a, a study unrelated to any of this once when I was in college, uh, looking at old periodicals, and I was looking through the New York Times. And I remember seeing a big, giant, half-page ad for this new rookie sensation, uh, Joe DiMaggio, who's uh, uh, touting the benefits of drinking milk. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, that's already, uh, just in the radio is still, in terms of family, every family having one, is still in its very early years. But already it's made a huge impact in that this guy is now getting major commercial endorsements because Everybody knows who he is because so many people are listening to uh, Yankee games uh, on the radio. So it's pretty interesting. And it's, and it's also interesting to think about what an explosion uh, electronic media was uh, to the whole uh, entertainment uh, system. Uh, Thomas Edison, for instance, was still conducting his film experiments, movie, motion picture experiments, in the 1890s. Okay, think about that. In the 1890s, He's doing experiments on motion pictures. Yet by 1922, that's only 32 years later from the time he's doing these initial experiments, about 30 million Americans saw a movie at least once a week. So what you have is a situation where there is no industry. 32 years later, it's a major entertainment industry. Uh, 30 million Americans saw a movie at least once a week. And uh, 25 years beyond that, going to, uh, uh, was it like 1947, uh, by 1947, movie attendance had jumped to 85 million a week. Anybody have any theories of why that happened? Why did movies explode the way they did? Why did a, a world that was dominated by print suddenly just go bonkers over this new technology motion pictures and in such a fast and big way. Why was the success so immediate? Any, any theories on that? Yeah. Wasn't it like during the Depression, like movies were a great way for people to like kind of escape reality? I think that's, a, that's in terms of the rising popularity, absolutely, uh, when the Depression hit uh, at the end of the 20s, <laughs> Uh, it certainly was a great escape mechanism. That's that's definitely true. Uh, but they were they were spiking even before then. I mean, we mentioned Charlie Chaplin, right? Uh, in the twenties, when before the depression was making a million dollars a year off of, of movies, um, why why did they they just catch on like wildfire? From a from a from a mass entertainment standpoint, what movies what movies provide that was different? Well, think of the different things they provided. Yeah. Um, well, it provided more of a visual experience. Because mm -hmm. um, I remember the first film that was ever like shown to people mm -hmm. was a train coming down the train tracks with yeah. the camera. And people jumped out of the way because they thought it was a train that was getting. Yeah. So it created, it was like something. 
something new and it was something that people had never experienced before. Um, so it was exciting too. And, that, and that's something to consider for a moment. Uh, the, the, just uh, what he's saying there about the fact that when people saw this footage of a train coming at them, it wasn't a 3D movie, and yet people, the reaction was to jump back. It, it really drives home the point of how new this experience was. We take it visual mediums for granted in, in our era, but then it was something so foreign that people actually had a physical reaction to it. Yeah. Yeah, if you couldn't hear that answer, she's saying that literacy uh, factors into this too. Obviously, literacy was on the rise in this country and others throughout the 1800s, but as we enter the 20th century, uh, we now have a new entertainment form that doesn't require literacy at all. It's something uh, you could go to if you have if a friend or a family member who isn't literate, you could go together and you could equally enjoy what you're watching. Uh, because it doesn't require uh, you to read anything or, or uh, make sense out of some kind of text. You just have to take in the visual experience. What I thought I would do now, um, in, in, just for like about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, because I think it's kind of a fun way to put you in the mindset of a movie audience then, is, is to show you about 10 or 15 minutes of a Charlie Chaplin film. Charlie Chaplin was, was a master at silent films. There's a reason he made so much money. Not only did he typically write all of his movies, he starred in all his movies, he directed his own movies, he wrote the scores for all his own movies. He, he was a you know, one-man entertainment machine, and he had, he had a really good sense of comic timing. So I want you to watch, I'm going to play just the beginning of one of his classic films. I want you just to... Uh, watch it from a couple of different perspectives. First of all, I want you to imagine that you are an audience of the time to who, whom uh, movies are still a relatively new thing. Uh, you're coming out of the world of just books and now you're entering this new visual medium. I want you to look at it from that standpoint and then I'd also like you to think about it from your standpoint as modern 2016 audience members, what you know about the silent film techniques of that era and how they're different than what you're, what you're used to in today's entertainment marketplace. So think about it from the standpoint of what it would be like to be in that position then and then what, um, how it's different than what you're used to in, in this era. What, uh, what you, some of your reactions uh, to that would be. Again, the, the two ways I want you to look at this was uh, the mindset of somebody who'd grown up with nothing but uh, books for entertainment and now you have this new um, art form, so to speak, that uh, can, it can entertain you, it's visual, it's, it's completely different than anything you've experienced before, moving pictures. What's, what's your reaction to that? Uh, were reading books like that obviously allowed for their imaginations to form, but when you have a movie, it's like their imaginations are coming to life. Mm -hmm. You can see them visually now. Okay, so yeah, so it's working a different part of your brain. Uh, it's definitely. What else? What 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 do you think? It uh, looking at this would be so uh, uh, impactful. What else would be so impactful in terms of trying to uh, you know think of it in terms of an entertainment source? Yeah. A lot of the jokes that you made were timeless. Mm -hmm. Like when the like him arguing with a guy who didn't realize it was much bigger than him, like you can still see that in movies today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, the physicality of the comedy, because uh, again, this is before the ability to record a dialogue as you're filming, you know, that the soundtrack's added in later. So so uh, the, the silent film era requires uh, uh, it particularly, again, if it's supposed to be a comedy of any sort, it, or even a drama, but it requires a certain physicality to really translate what's going on, uh, because you can't tell jokes. You have to perform jokes that be visual humor, and uh, 
and also uh, uh, motions have to be sometimes a little larger than life too to really uh, drive home the point of what you're, you're trying to accomplish in the film. Any, any other reactions on the, on the uh, first question regarding its, its perception, how it would have been perceived by audiences of that era? Yeah. How do we make sure of everything? Because you, you're reading, because it's silent film, so you're reading dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, you have music and you have images to look at. So it's kind of like a sensory overload mm -hmm. kind of a thing, yeah. probably at that time. Uh, yeah. Because you never really had all three in one spot before. Yeah, appealing to multiple senses and different senses than the people are accustomed to. Yeah. You saw what? I see more movies than I can. Okay. So it was almost as fresh, as fresh as it's going to be different. Yeah. Which, is the, which that answer kind of uh, uh, is a good uh, transition into the second part of this question was as modern entertainment uh, audiences, uh, how, how do you, uh, how does this strike you as different or the same, uh, but how does it compare to what you're used to in terms of entertainment? Yeah. Um, more for us to laugh. I feel like back then, you would see that and everybody would burst out laughing. Mm -hmm. Today, we, we have more. Yeah, content. so a more innocent time and, and the, the, the plot and the humor reflects that. It's, it's very gentle. Uh, most movies of that era were meant to be seen by all ages, and so that's you know one of the parameters that they work within. What else do you notice watching this in terms of, uh, and it can be technical things as well, yeah. She's saying you have to throw more of yourself really into the film. You have to pay closer attention because um, uh, it, it's it's not it doesn't have the, the fast pace that you're used to. You have to really uh, you have to try harder to focus. I, I think that. What else? Um, kind of I saw a hand over here too. Yeah, I think to add on what you were saying, like it also takes a lot for us to be loud now. So now you can put in monsters and dinosaurs or whatever with special effects, but in that movie, like, the set is so simple, you don't really need much. Yeah, uh, you uh, mentioned that you hear that about the that that we are are harder to impress in terms of the wow factor uh, these days because we've because special effects are just off the charts and. Here it's a very simple uh, production. What were you going to say? Um, yeah. There's like more room for your own personal interpretation mm -hmm. because it's not like completely straightforward, like it's happening and everything. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, talking about the technicalities, like you said, all of the shots are from the same angle. Nowadays you cut back and forth to the person's face during the dialogue, and it's all just one steady shot. All the edits are the same. Yeah, that's it's that's something I notice as well, uh, being from the world of video production, that fact that so much is done in what we call post now in terms of quick edits and effects and music and what have you, and so much of what's done here is is done in front of the camera. Uh, you, you think about what Charlie Chaplin had to do to choreograph every one of those scenes, yeah. I kind of disagree with that, actually. Uh -huh. um, I think this kind of shows how much film hasn't changed uh -huh. in the sense of uh, how moments are captured and camera angles and just the general laws of uh -huh. filmmaking. Uh -huh. um, it, this is kind of when they were created and developed mm -hmm. and they haven't really changed since then. So I think this is a good example of how it began and how it has stayed. Yeah, and, and there can be an argument for that as well in terms of like you talk about rules of framing and shots and different types of things. Uh, an example I use, for instance, uh, going to television, which we'll talk more about in a second, 
he is, uh, everybody's familiar with I Love Lucy, right? The, the, the uh, sitcom of the 50s, one of the first really huge sitcom. It was the first uh, sitcom to be filmed uh, and the first uh, uh, show done before a live audience and done with a three camera setup, uh, which is still the basis for many sitcoms today. It, it, so the, the, this, this technique they came up with in the 1950s is still the basis for many live audience sitcoms. Uh, I saw a hand up over here now. Um, going off of that point, I also noticed that the music from that movie totally went Yeah, remember we talked about media codes uh, uh, last week and uh, that great example of uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin who wrote the score for this, you know, using that media code of the score to, to let you know what kind of things you might want to be feeling at that moment and where, where the story is going. Uh, okay, good comments. Any other comments? All right. So, uh, we talked about, you know, the impact of the film and again, this was really the first big breakthrough of the electronic uh, media entertainment age. But the uh, next one was uh, close behind, radio. I uh, already referenced how radio turned uh, sports stars uh, into uh, you know, multi-million dollar players. Uh, but let's, let's talk more about radio and uh, why uh, it was particularly impactful as an entertainment device. It's important to point out that the development of radio, which again, the experiments, early experiments for radio were around the late 1800s, and then radio in terms of a something you could have in your home really started to take off in the 1920s, and by the 1930s, it, it was really a very dominant medium. So uh, thinking about the fact that as radio is developing, concurrent to that, uh, the phonograph was being developed. Re, you know, recorded music that you could play, uh, uh, and, and it, that's when uh, in the early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, they developed the flat disc format, which would become the format that would be used all the way through uh, the 1980s as the dominant music format. But yet at this point, even though there were records that you could buy, uh, records were not taking off at the same level as radio. Radio was exploding the trajectory for uh, recorded music much slower. Um, why do you think that might have been? Why was radio the right device at the right time? Yeah. Um, because you, with the records, you had to buy the system and you had to buy each individual record. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of space, whereas the radio was a single unit. Yeah, and, and the cost factor is really important that you brought up. The fact that uh, this is a one-time purchase, okay? Yeah, you might, you might um, have to change the tubes in it from time to time. I, you would call out a radio repairman. I remember the television repairman uh, when that was a thing when I was a kid, that you'd actually call somebody to come to your house, they'd get in the back of your set and replace some tubes and your TV would work again. Uh, same thing for radio, but generally speaking, it was a one-time cost. It provided you with a constant uh, source of uh, entertainment and news. And that's important to point out, too. We're now starting to see news and information take an electronic form. Um, whereas uh, records, as you mentioned, you have to buy the system. Then you have to buy the individual records. And they were much more expensive then, too, because, first of all, they were made out of a shellac-based product. If you've ever seen an old movie where somebody gets mad and hits a record on the table and it shatters like a piece of glass, uh, that's because uh, they weren't made out of the vinyl-based products that later albums would be made of, where those are a little more durable. They don't, they don't shatter. If you, if they can still break, but they wouldn't shatter. You'd have to hit them really hard. Uh, so, so, so they were expensive. Uh, they, they weren't very durable. And they played at what was called 78 revolutions per minute, uh, meaning that uh, that's how many times uh, it spun around in the course of a minute, which is a very fast speed, which means you could only get probably five to seven minutes per side of a big album, as compared to later eras when they moved the speed to 33 and a third, and you're able to get 
uh, up to around 20 minutes on each side. So it wasn't a very good investment either, even though it was, ex it was expensive and, and you didn't get much for your money. So radio was a much uh, a more sane form of entertainment for the average family, especially as you go into the Depression, when people really have a lot of problems with discretionary income and, and with, uh, with uh, being able to spend money on things, you know. So uh, radio allowed them to be entertained and <coughs> not uh, have to spend a lot of money. It's also important to point out about radio that in, in terms of it, its development and its impact beyond the entertainment factor, as I mentioned before, news and information is now uh, uh, being carried on radio. For instance, when uh, Charles Lindbergh became the first person to uh, fly a plane <coughs> across the Atlantic, radio stations across the country were giving uh, regular hourly bulletins on you know, what they're hearing from all the tracking stations about where he is and how he's doing. So people were in a sense able to follow that journey live. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the, the president who um, was there for much of the uh, early explosion of radio, uh, he developed what became known as fireside chats. He would give weekly radio addresses and because people tended to be sitting next to their fireplace listening to the radio. That's where the, the name came from. And that's impactful too, because it's something we don't really think about, that until radio, most Americans did not know what their president sounded like. Think about that. You would have when would you have had an opportunity <coughs> to hear the president's voice? Only if you went to a rally someplace, again, typically in a larger urban setting, would you, would you even have that opportunity? And suddenly, you have a president who is able to talk to Americans every single week. And it created this sense of uh, intimacy with a lot of people where they feel like they knew their president. So this is a whole new dynamic in politics in terms of using media to try to forge relationships with uh, uh, complete strangers. So we talked about uh, the fact that uh, 85 million people were going to the movies uh, every week in 1947. That same year, 93% of U.S. homes had radio. So put it in, in another way, uh, in, in an average week, Americans in 1947 were spending roughly 200 million hours a week with movies and more than 3 billion hours a week with radio. And, you know, and, and again, think about, this is 1947, just push the clock back 50 years when neither of these things existed. And think about how much of our time uh, as a society they were now taking up. That's, that's, a, that's a huge sea change in terms of how we spend our leisure time. But shortly after 1947, both radio listenership and movie attendance fell off. Does anybody know why? Why did they, after they this skyrocketing crazy amount of time people spent radio and movies and suddenly a decline? Any guesses? Yeah. Television. Television, yeah. Television was the next big disruptor uh, in terms of technology. So let's take a, a quick uh, five minute break and then we will uh, uh, pick up uh, with the impact of television and then move things along uh, to uh, the internet. Okay, I'd like right now to, before we get talking about the next uh, two parts of, uh, of this discussion as we uh, bring our uh, travel through time of uh, entertainment and also just communication in general and bring it up today, before we uh, move forward with that, I want to take a few moments since the theme of today is, is media entertainment to uh, have you tackle these three questions right now. Uh, first question, name a product of mass media entertainment that has had an impact on your life. It could be a movie, it could be a piece of music, it could be a book, it could be anything you, that you feel has had an impact on your life. So what is that and, and why? Uh, why is it impacting you? How has it impacted you? The second question, some believe that mass media has made entertainment more democratic. We've talked a little bit about that in class, the fact that anybody can access, for instance, the internet and, and learn things and be entertained by things. Uh, others, though, say it is dumbing down society. You've heard that argument as well. What do you think? 
is, is it making entertainment more democratic or is it a dumbing down society? Give us your opinion on that question. And third, how has the internet improved our lives? Also, how has it, has it harmed our lives, potentially? Okay. So uh, quickly write down some uh, answers to those three questions. Like always, I'll have you break into small groups to share your answers with each other. Then we'll, we'll hear what some of your answers are in a larger class setting. Go ahead and write down some answers. OK, so the first question was, name a project of mass media entertainment that has had an impact on your life. Who would like to uh, share some of the things that have made an impact on your lives and maybe a little bit about why? Who wants to get back to the no one? Oh, there he is. Uh, I think that it's such a pretty like, experience over there. It's just really fucked up because you like see the good in everyone's life, so you don't, like, you kind of shake your life, like, oh, they're not only as fun as that. Because, like, their lives are perfect on uh -huh. Instagram, but okay. it's just how they make it look. So social media as a whole has had a big impact on yeah. your life. OK, that's a good answer. What else? Yeah. Um, for me personally, I put, um, like, having, like, easy access to music all the time. Mm -hmm. So like, um, I find like whenever like I have time I'm always listening to music, I feel like that is like really impactful on my yeah. life. Yeah. I'm assuming a lot of other people also. No, I can relate to that. I'm that way. I've got a ridiculous music collection at home that I never get to listen to, but someday, yeah. Um, That's a really good point. A lot of us grew up with the Disney movies, and I've had students in us, other classes write papers about some of the mixed messages, particularly that women might get uh, from some of those older Disney movies. So you know, it's, it's a really interesting thing in terms of things that shape our uh, perception uh, of the world. What else? Impactful things. Media entertainment has <coughs> been impactful in your life. We all have them. Let's hear a few more. Yeah. Uh, you were what? I saw that, and now it's probably my favorite genre of movie. Okay, so it, it, it got you into a whole uh, kind of movie that you hadn't paid much attention to before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this one's a little darker, but music <laughs> definitely uh, helped because throughout middle school and high school, I was uh, clinically suicidal. Uh huh. Um, and my well trend never really helped. Mm -hmm. uh, but music was able to, like, playing music and listening to music really helped me um, get through that without yeah. doing anything stupid. So. No, that's, that's actually a really good example because, uh, you know, it's been proven that, you know, music is therapeutic. I, I do that still. If I'm having a really, really bad week or day, I go home and I turn my favorite whatever on as loud as I can, which is the opposite of what my wife does. She likes... When she wants to use music, she wants it soft and quiet. So we kind of sometimes work at different uh, levels in terms of how we use music. But the louder, the better. That's how I do it. You know, when I'm feeling bad, and it always cheers me up. Uh, what else? Anything? Yeah. Uh, the movie The Count of Monte Cristo. Mm. I thought that was really inspiring when I first saw it. I watched it over and over again, especially if like I need motivation to do something. Uh huh. Because he knows himself. see that movie and watch the transformation and try to replicate that, that's, a, that's another good point, that, that uh, uh, media, certain media, movies, for instance, or books can be motivational for us. Even though they're structured as entertainment, we can take something away that makes us view ourselves differently or view how we should uh, uh, approach our lives differently. A really good example. Anything else? Okay, well, let's go ahead and then move to number two. Some believe mass media has made entertainment more democratic. We talked about that in the first part of this uh, lecture today, the fact that mass gives more people access to things that they didn't have before. You <coughs> say it's dumbing down society. What's your opinion on that question? Yeah. Um, I guess, like, in a way, you could say it's dumbing down our society just because, like, people become really dependent on their phones instead of, like, thinking for themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else? Uh, increased media attention is taken away from the other important aspects of our lives. Most students will spend like eight hours a day on their phones or something, but like they go to school the next day and they like, don't even have their homework done. Yeah. It's like, it's just kind of like distracting us. And 
So it's so by not getting, yeah, your work done, it literally is dumbing us down because we're not doing the things we're supposed to be doing for classes, prepping for exams, doing papers. That's a really good example. Yeah. I think in a way that's like pretty valid because a lot of people will abuse the technology privileges we mm -hmm. have, but I think it's also like the advancements and everything that are going on are also helping us like, mm -hmm. with other issues. Okay, so you're, you're kind of floating in the middle with your answer, yeah. Uh, To that point, we've also talked about how, for instance, social media is now uh, influencing news content. So sometimes stories are getting covered because they're big on social media, but maybe they're really not that important. Yeah. I think dumbing down is more like if you take something, or if you take people who have bad or dumb ideas mm -hmm. and you give them a platform mm -hmm. to spread these bad or dumb ideas to a lot of people, then that That's an interesting point, and, and it kind of relates to uh, something I've said before in classes. I always say the greatest thing about the internet is anyone can use it. The worst thing about the internet is anyone can use it. So, you know, it, 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 I can see exactly what you're talking about. It, it gives a voice to everybody, but sometimes some of those voices you, would, you kind of prefer didn't have a platform or a forum, yeah. Anything else in on that question? All right, let's go to number three then. How has the internet improved our lives? And this is kind of related to some of the answers we just heard. Um, how has it harmed them? What ways has it been a, a positive thing for you, uh, you, having been really the first generation to grow up entirely in the internet age? How has it been a benefit to you? How do you think it's been a hindrance? Who wants to tackle that? There with you every single day. You all have it here in this room with you. How's it? How, how's it? Been? Yeah. You what? Yeah. So, so you, it sounds like you're making the, the argument for a bit of an information overload. Yeah, we have all this information, but it, it just kind of what? Yeah, what do we do with all of this information? How do we use it properly? Did I see a hand over here? No? Okay. All right. Who, anybody? Hands? Okay, now I see your hand. All right. I don't know if you're talking about like pros or cons right now, but like. Either one, yeah. Like a con, like, because like the more people that like stay on their phone, it's like so hard to grasp somebody's attention. Like when my best friend talks to me, like mm -hmm. I literally don't care to say what she says. Like I ask her to repeat like three times because I'm just on my phone and I don't listen. Yeah. It's like really hard to like connect with someone when they're connected more to their phones. Like I read yeah. this thing the other day that. People are actually becoming addicted to their phones. Like the more we stare at our screen, it releases like dopamine in your brain, which is like um, what is released when you're doing drugs, and it's literally making you addicted to your cell phone. Mm -hmm. So you just want to be on all the time. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's a really interesting point too. I, I experienced that in my own life, and that uh, uh, my wife has completely adapted to the iPhone era and uh, whenever we go anywhere, she's constantly if we were this, the speaker um, uh, in the car, she has on speaker and she, she's constantly on the phone, constantly taking calls, making calls. I once it took me about the 45 miles to tell a one minute story because every time I would start telling the story, a call would come in and I get pushed to the side and so, it, it's been a source of friction sometimes on car journeys, uh, the fact that uh, people do get so plugged into it, yeah.
That's a really good point, the fact that you have a whole generation of parents, my generation of parents, who uh, are experiencing all these forms of media that didn't exist and we're trying to figure out proper usage, proper blocks, you know, what's right, what's wrong, and just really fumbling around trying to figure it all out. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like you said, with possibly you're going to have a much better handle on it uh, when you become parents because you have gone through all of this and are going to be much more savvy to some of this. Yeah. Um, kind of what you said, uh, it's, I wouldn't even say, I think we're past addicted. I think we're more dependent now, mm -hmm. which, which is kind of a problem. Uh, we're dependent on media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, for me, it's bad because you know sometimes I'll do something embarrassing, and my friends will record me and I post it, and I don't know about it. And you know I don't want certain people to see that. Like I want, I feel like I don't have privacy. Like I have to kind of watch what I say sometimes because someone will get on film. Yeah. And or my mom will post really ugly pictures on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I have to beg her. She's, yeah. She's older. Well, she's not. Um, I have, she doesn't have, she feel like she doesn't understand how Facebook works, so she can, she can post these terrible pictures all the time. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of being tagged uh, on Facebook. That's not one of my favorite things. And by the way, because we do talk about this a lot in, in classes, the fact that you have to be really careful, as you mentioned, about what you're doing, who's taking a picture, because it could end up online, and of course the whole concept that you got to be careful with your page because if you apply for jobs, uh, employers will try to look at your page and see what kind of stuff's on there. See, all these things you have to worry about. And I, I remember saying one time, well, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I didn't have to worry about that when I was in college. And then, lo and behold, about a week later, somebody tags me on Facebook. They found an old photo of me at a party in college and scanned it and put it on Facebook. So I'm like, oh, come on. You know, so even tough stuff that happened 30 years ago can come back to haunt you. Yeah. Um, well, I feel like a lot of people are talking about, like, the negative aspects of it, but I feel like there's still a lot that is, like, good about it. Yeah. So, like, I think of, um, like, it provides a platform to connect, like, the entire world, you know? So like I, I think of like the terrorist attack like in Paris and how like there was so much like like support and like love like being spread around and, like there's so much potential mm -hmm. like to connect everyone like in like in an international sense like it can be like an amazing thing to see. Yeah, and it's not only connect but to actually interact. I think that's a really key thing about the internet. There was a, a term coined in the '60s by a media scholar. In the, the, the term was the global village. The fact that television, in, in his theory, was going to turn us, start turning us into a global village because we could see things from all over the world. And I think he was partially right, but the one thing that was flawed in that theory at the time was, yeah, we could see things from all over the world now, but it didn't, didn't mean we're necessarily interacting. Now there's this ability to interact uh, through the internet, so I think the concept of a global village is, is much more uh, realistic today than it was in the television era. Okay, any other questions? I mean, any other answers? I should say. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's move back to uh, we where we left off, which was talking about uh, television coming in in the late '40s, early '50s, and becoming a huge disruptor to uh, a media world that had already been uh, significantly disrupted less than 50 years earlier with uh, the uh, creation of motion pictures and then shortly after that a radio. So now here comes television which is kind of doing things that both motion pictures and radio was, was doing in, in terms of providing visual entertainment but also starting to provide you uh, immediacy as well. And it also in, in, in disrupting our, our mass media entertainment world, it created a whole new galaxy of stars, people who weren't <coughs> reached before. In fact, a lot of the people who became the early stars uh, in television were already working on radio. They had radio shows, and they decided to move those shows to television, and in some cases with tremendous success. success I mentioned uh, Lucille Ball uh, earlier, uh, and I Love Lucy. This was a classic example. You know, who's seen at least one episode of I Love Lucy? 
it's pretty amazing that a show as old as that, and yet still everybody's, almost everybody's seen at least one episode. Yeah. Wasn't it also groundbreaking because it was the first or multi-racial couple to be? Yeah. That's that, and that's true too. Absolutely, uh, we, you know, we, we'll talk more about that when we talk about the media uh, and uh, ethnic groups and stereotypes. Uh, that that's a really key moment in that you had uh, a, a Cuban as the co-lead in this show. But um, more importantly, like for Lucille Ball in terms of the entertainment aspect, she had a radio show that was very similar to what she put on uh, television. Now. She was moderately successful on radio, but wildly successful on television. Anybody who's seen an episode of her show or multiple episodes of I Love Lucy, can you tell me why she was so suited to the medium of television, this brand new medium? Yeah. She was very quirky. She was like the first TV character who was very quirky. It was a mix of slapstick, her voice. It was like something Yeah, uh, what were you going to say? Um, I was going to say, like, her voice is kind of rough. Like, just listening to her voice is kind of different and annoying. But, like, when you see her, like, her facial expressions and, like, how she acts and stuff, it makes it, like, I don't know, it's easier on the eye than it is on the ear. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and, and let's talk about the visual aspect in terms of what, what when you think about, uh, if, if for those of you who've watched uh, multiple episodes, when you think about what would be considered classic Lucy moments, what kind of comedy is she known for? Is she known for telling jokes? What, what, what do you remember? Do you remember anything from <coughs> any of the shows you watch? What do you remember? Yeah. She would make a fool of herself. Yeah, and, and usually in a, in a, we talked about this with Charlie Chaplin, in a physical way. That's why the show still gets shown around the world today. It's why it was so universally shown at the height of its popularity, is because you could translate that show into virtually any language and people would still get it because the jokes weren't about certain things happening in American society as much as they were about ridiculous situations and a lot of physical comedy. And all the most famous bits I was thinking of the one that he gets played a lot where her and her friend Ethel are working on the candy uh, conveyor belt. You know, it's physical comedy. And in fact, um, she, she said you know, later on that one of her big influences in terms of uh, comedy was Charlie Chaplin because he was, you could see in the clip we played, so physical uh, in his, his comedy. Uh, so this whole new uh, medium of entertainment exploded, and it became so big, again, using I Love you, Lucy as an example, uh, something that had never happened before in American life happened during the run of that show. Uh, at one point in the series, her character is expecting a baby. And uh, the reason they wrote that into the show was because Lucille Ball herself was expecting a baby, and so they wrote the pregnancy into the show. Uh, just by uh, pure happenstance, uh, the night the episode of her giving birth um, aired on CBS, she actually did give birth mm -hmm. to her real child that same day. Um, and what was significant about this was that the same day this happened, uh, President Eisenhower gave a a major uh, speech uh, on some uh, domestic policies that was it was a it was a big news story and he got bumped to the under the fold of the front page Lucy got the top of the front page okay that had never happened before a, tr a president had never been topped by an entertainment figure and so it, it's significant because I would argue that probably happens on a regular basis now doesn't it uh, in fact, it, it would, if, if, uh, if, if it's a battle between uh, you know, Charlie Sheen going crazy doing something and President Obama giving a speech, probably Charlie Sheen's going to grab the top part of the newspaper. That's, that's the kind of world we live in now. And this was the first time uh, something like this had happened. Uh, television was also making inroads into, uh, again, social impact as well. The other picture I have up here is uh, Edward R. Murrow, who was a well-known broadcaster who made his name on radio broadcasting from London uh, during World War II. Uh, he went into television and created news programming that aired uh, 
uh, on a pretty regular basis that looked at deeper into topics. Uh, for instance, uh, he was probably the first uh, uh, person on television to explore the exploitation of migrant farm workers. It, it was a topic that had never been tackled before. He really uncovered a lot of the abuses that were going on. This is in the 1950s. He also most, was most famous for, which was depicted in the uh, uh, film Good Night and Good Luck, took on uh, uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy, uh, who, who was uh, leading a bunch of hearings in Congress to root out communists who supposedly were in government and in the process was essentially ruining a lot of innocent people's lives by not giving them due process. He exposed his techniques on television and basically led to him being censured by the Senate and, and losing this uh, power that he had had uh, for some time. So. A lot, of, a lot of social impact in terms of uh, television uh, during the 50s as well. But I would say that if you pick a turning point where television became the medium um, uh, in terms of the go-to medium was, was the Kennedy assassination, okay? What happened, what happened uh, on November 22nd, 1963, when President Kennedy was shot, all the stations went live and were, were reporting details as they unfolded. And essentially, all the news uh, crews were live continuously for the next several days, right through uh, the funeral several days later. Uh, this is among my very earliest television memories. I was only uh, four years old at the time, but I remember my parents having the television on and they constantly all day long and everybody sitting around watching it. I remember that feeling. Probably very similar to maybe some of your vague recollections of 9-11. You probably have a few vague memories of everybody sitting around the TV. You know, it's the same kind of thing. It was the first time it really happened. And it really ushered in uh, uh, television as the uh, go-to medium, which uh, it would hang on to until, of course, uh, the internet age. So let's talk about uh, the internet to kind of uh, to wrap up our discussion of uh, big moments in, in media history. Does anybody know, um, first of all, it, the internet could not have happened without the personal computer. Does anybody know when the first um, computers were developed? Yeah. Personal computers? Or computers? Well, let's just go computers, yeah, computers. Um, Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like NASA had the highest or you know, yeah. advanced computers at the time, which now, by the way, are like we have the same amount in our cell phones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that the history of computers goes back a lot further. Uh, you're right. Yeah. Businesses started incorporating them. Uh, I remember. Uh, as a college student uh, in the late 70s working on our student newspaper, we got video display terminals where we could type in our copy and then, and then amazingly it would print it out into newsprint form which we would put on our board. We just thought this is the craziest technology ever, you know. So, um, but that's, you know, was, was starting to get into education at that point. But um, anybody ever see, uh, what was the uh, movie uh, with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch? Uh, he, he plays the, um, the computer programmer hub. Uh, the imitation game. Yeah, imitation game. Anybody see that movie? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's a computer. That's a computer that was developed to try to decode messages, uh, enemy messages. And, he, and his character, of course, was very instrumental in, in developing this programming system. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 researchers had developed um, uh, operational small, small electronic computer, um, in terms of a small computer, that was a huge computer if you remember the movie, but in terms of smaller computers, uh, there were uh, computers developed in 1939 uh, that uh, fit the mode of computer. Uh, in 1946, um, a scientist by the name of John von Neumann, he created the theory, theoretical model of the modern computer which in fact every electronic computer since then has generally followed his principles. So the history of the personal computer goes back uh, uh, quite a ways. Now what about the internet? When, when did the internet first become uh, a thing and, and first uh, come into existence in any way, shape, or form? Yeah. Huh? 
Further back than that, yeah. It was like 1963. It was actually, I believe, in the, you're close. It's, I think it was uh, in the uh, later 60s what, it was when it, it came into play. Um, um, 65, actually. So, yeah, you're really close. So, mid-60s. Uh, they uh, it came into play at, 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 first in 1965 and then developed over the next few years. Anybody to know, know how it was created? Yeah. Wasn't it originally, like, for universities? And it was a way that universities could send each other instant messages, like through email and mm -hmm. stuff? Yeah, you're close. It was... Universities played a critical role in the development of the internet. It was actually an idea of the Department of Defense. It was a government idea um, because um, at, in that era, we were still in the, the so-called Cold War, and there was a lot of concern of what if we got into a war with the Soviet Union? What if there was a nuclear attack? What if the enemy tried to knock out our communication systems? All they would have to do was blow up some key towers and, and uh, facilities, and they could essentially wipe out our ability to communicate. So the government said, what if we could come up with a decentralized form of communication that wasn't uh, in one place that could move in different directions? And uh, that's when they turned to universities and said, hey, can you help us with this project? So. Um, by 1969, uh, this four-year-old program had, had signed on uh, first UCLA and Stanford, and then they added the University of Utah and UC Santa Barbara. So they were the original universities to take, uh, take part in this experiment. And again, the whole idea was a de decentralized communication system. Um, and I remember, uh, that's one thing that I, my, my college professors got right. They, they, they used to talk about in the late 70s that someday you're going to read the newspaper online and you're going to do all this, all this business online. And it actually came true. I'm always amazed when a, an instructor predicts something that ha actually happens because I also remember my school teachers in grade school promised me, promised me that by the 1980s our entire country would be metric. Uh, you know, and so obviously that didn't happen. More often than not, these predictions don't come true. But the reason college professors knew about this is because it was the talk of the university system, these experiments that were going on, and they knew something big was coming someday. They didn't know what form it would take. Obviously, it did need uh, the critical component of the personal, affordable personal computer. And of course, we most of us know that story. That's uh, with uh, you know Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak uh, working in Cupertino, uh, putting together uh, something in their garage. I'm sure mocked by their friends for spending all this time on this project. But um, would lead to that just a few short years later, after they're they're working on this project in 1983, there were already 3.5 million personal computers out there in the market. And it, it just continued to explode and explode until um, by the time you get to the mid-90s, it's more common than not for people to have a, a, a personal computer and internet access. Of course, a much different thing then. And again, most of you probably don't remember it. You may not have even been born when your parents got their first uh, computer. But the thing I remember about my first home computer that it was completely amazing to me that, first of all, that it had um, five gigabytes of storage on it. Wow. How is that even possible? Of course, what, what, what the typical flash drive have now, probably like 160 gigs or something, but um, five gigabytes, and we were amazed by that. And then um, the thing called dial-up modem. Uh, that you use to get your, your pages. So you would, you would hit, click on a, a internet page and then you'd watch it slowly come up on your screen. You know, and then within about five to 10 minutes you would have a page. And wow, that's just amazing. Can you believe you could actually load a page from someplace else in, up in under 10 minutes? Crazy. As I've mentioned before, now if it takes longer than two seconds, we, we get you know, we don't like that. You know, it's taking too long. Why isn't the page up yet? Okay, so so that's that's the start of you know what became the age that we're living in now, the the, the internet age. Um, 
And again, I find it really fascinating that uh, for all of you that you are the first, the first generation to grow up exclusively uh, in the internet world. And again, it's just second nature to you. It's just part of who you are. Um, do you think about, and this is what the question, some of this last question was about, do you think about the subtle ways that it impacts in, in your life that, again, it's always been there, so it's not, it's not like me where I go, wow, I used to do this, now I do this. It's always been there for you, yeah. Yeah, like for me, I, I feel like the internet is sort of like the new parent, mm -hmm. kind of the new parenting technique. So I remember when I was a little toddler, and my dad did take me to work with him. He'd just sit me down at one of like the old, like the big, old beige computers that still have a dial, and I'd play like Nick Jr. online while he worked. Yeah. And that was just like my thing. Like I did that until like it was three o'clock and I'd get to go home. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting in the applications it's had in terms of parenting. Yeah, I remember as a child um, being told to go watch cartoons uh, on TV. You know, that was the electronic babysitter for me, but now it's just gone a whole nother level, hasn't it? I, I have a two-year-old granddaughter, and uh, her mom, uh, when they're traveling, so they, they, when they come to visit us, for instance, or they live in Chico, so if they come to visit, she's got her own little mini um, um, iPad and I, I load movies on there for her so that they soon they get in the car, they give her her iPad and she can watch some Disney classic, you know, Finding Nemo or something during the drive and she doesn't make a fuss. And I'm like, wow, you know, that wasn't even a thing. And, and, and it's really, um, it wasn't even a thing when my kids, uh, my oldest kids were younger. Uh, this is something that I, I noticed several years ago as well. When uh, our oldest kids were just little, I'm talking about uh, early to mid 90s. And we go on a family trip, say Disneyland. I'm sure a few of you have been on those kind of trips. Uh, you know, the long car ride down the always beautiful I 5, you know, going to Los Angeles, right? <laughs> and it, in those days, it, it, it would turn into a bloodbath sometimes because. You know, kids are sitting next to each other for hours at a time. There's a lot of punching. There's a lot of yelling. <laughs> there's me driving, threatening to pull the car over, and then you're really going to get it if you don't be quiet. And then suddenly one year we went on one of these trips, and I noticed it's quiet. And I, I have a, a one person listening to something on, uh, you know, on their phone, like music or an i iBook or whatever. You know, they're listening to something. Uh, another person's texting. Everybody's got their own personal media now and, uh, and, and are virtually ignoring each other and I'm just driving in silence. I thought I would like that, but after a while I was a little concerned like, is, is this really what I want? Is this really a good thing? Maybe it would be nice to have an occasional slugfest in the back seat with the kids. At least they're interacting, right? Um, have you had experiences like that in your families where, where it used to be one way and now it's very different because of all the media toys you have now and the ability to uh, access entertainment from anywhere, including driving down a freeway? What have been your experiences with that? And what do you think about the whole concept of whether that's a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. Um, at least when I was younger, I mean, like, school, like early years during school, mm -hmm. nobody had a cell phone still. Yeah. So it was really cool and so we had when when that came out right away I was yeah. probably sixth grade. You know? And like that was the cool new thing. But now you go around and you see middle schoolers and they all so freaking out a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what else? What 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 are your thoughts on, on how technology has we uh, individualized us? It's made us more individualistic, yeah. I was the oldest of my brothers and sisters, so I always felt my younger brothers and sisters were more spoiled than me. And I think that's the lament of every oldest child, right? Um, yeah. I think it's a maturity thing, too. So, like, when you're in middle school or maybe even early high school, a lot of people don't want anything to do with their parents. Mm -hmm. So, if you're on a long car ride, they'll just brood in your corner uh -huh. whatever they're having against them. Uh, but then I noticed. Mm -hmm. And then once conversation 
cut it down and go back to it. And then, you know, so I think it's a maturity thing yeah. and being able to interact with that. Yeah. Anybody else? Thoughts about how the internet has, has changed your relationship dynamics within your family or with your friends? Yeah. Like me, it sounds like me and my wife. We have the same arguments, yes. It's annoying. Uh -huh. She like she doesn't get it, you know. She's like, oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. and it goes back to I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> it blows my mind. Uh huh. Yeah. I think when you're in person with somebody, it can definitely serve as a detriment. But let's say like you've been away from a family member for a long time and you haven't seen them, but you have something like FaceTime mm -hmm. and you get to use that. That's even more personal than a phone call. Yeah. And for you to talk to them there, like I'm sure probably like. Week four, week three now, like some of us have probably FaceTimed like our grandparents or our parents. Yeah, and, and, and that's, a, that's a really good look at the flip side of things too, you know, because I agree like 100% with those last two answers because, again, I get in many battles with my spouse over her ignoring me in favor of her phone. And at the same time, we, we use the computer to talk to our granddaughter when she's not visiting us, you know, so like several times a week she will be having conversations with her and, 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 and things that my grandparents, so I had grandparents who lived several states away when I was growing up and they could not do with me, you know, phone was not the same, occasionally a phone call, but just being able to see the facial uh, expressions I think is cool and, and also just staying in touch with people. I find with social media, I'm reconnecting with old friends or staying in touch with relatives from different parts of the country that I never would have without social media. So that's that's a really good argument on, on the plus side. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely So I think, I th yeah. So I think, I think that the lesson to be learned from some of these comments is that technology is only as detrimental or as helpful as we make it. It really, and we've mentioned this point before. It really does come down to how we use it, right? And that's what we're going to be uh, getting back to exploring in, in the weeks ahead. We're going to be looking at the media from uh, all these different prisms in terms of how we use it, how it affects <coughs> us. And, and I totally agree with the concept that something in and of itself is not inherently bad or good, but our use of it. It, it comes down to, uh, I think the first week I mentioned the uh, Edward R. Murrow quote uh, about how we use it is so important, and if we don't use it properly, it's nothing but a bunch of uh, lights in a box. Well, it's the same thing you can say about the internet or any of our new technology. So we're going to uh, get deeper into examining our relationship with our media. So uh, along those lines, uh, our readings next week, we're back to the textbook, and it's going to be uh, chapters uh, two and three in the textbook, where we'll be examining both of uh, the concept of corporate-owned media as well as media in terms of the context of politics and political influence. So see you in one week.